So the topic for today would be uh, quantum phase estimation and, uh, and the connection between discrete and continuous Fourier transform. Uh, right, so quantum phase estimation, it's a very important uh, algorithmic primitive in quantum computing. Uh, Shor's algorithm can be explained using phase estimation as well as almost every other quantum algorithms in a way. Uh, so what's phase estimation? Uh, the problem is that you are given a unitary U and we say that it's a black box unitary in the sense that we don't ask you many extra knowledge about it. So we, it means that we can't really exploit its structure. We just know that it's a unitary and we basically don't ask you any other knowledge about this but we can apply this unitary as a quantum circuit. <coughs> and we are also given, now for simplicity, let's say we are given a, an eigenvector psi with some eigenvalue, va uh, e to the two pi i phi, which is unknown to us, but we would like to learn this phase, this uh, phi which is in zero and one, by implementing some quantum operation that basically writes this uh, uh, phase next to the eigenvector that we already have in the quantum computer. <coughs> so this is the task. Um, and here is the, the quantum phase estimation circuit, which works very nicely um, when we have that this uh, phase, this unknown phase, is actually a number which can be represented in binary on the n bits that we have available. So <coughs> It's clear that if, if it's some irrational number, then we cannot ex exactly represent it, but if we are for fortunate enough that it's actually some binary number of n bits, then the following circuit works. So what it does, uh, first it creates a uniform superposition over n qubits, and then uh, interprets this number as a, as a binary number describing an integer. And so if this uh, binary number here represents a as an integer in this superposition, then we would like to apply uh, the unitary to the power t on this eigenstate that we have. And so this is just an efficient implementation of that. So this is the first, the, the least significant bit of our integer. So if it's zero, then we don't apply u. If it's one, then we apply u once. Now this is the second bit. If it's zero, we don't apply uh, u square, but uh, if it's one, then we apply u twice. And so on, we have like the, the next bit would be uh, for, for uh, value four. So we either apply u to the four or not, depending on this bit and so on. And in the last bit, we apply u to the two to the n minus one, uh, depending on the value of this last bit. Uh, and then at the end, we use our favorite animal, the quantum Fourier transform over these uh, n integers, in integers in Zn and where this capital N is, as usual, two to the lowercase n. And so if, if we were lucky enough that this uh, unknown phase was indeed an n-bit binary number, then we would just get back exactly these n-bits here. And, and th as a bonus, our eigenstate will not get disturbed. Okay, so why is that the case? Let's just walk through this algorithm. We start with the eigenstate psi and n zero qubits. We apply the Hadamard transform, and that just creates a uniform superposition over these integers from t equals zero to n minus one, the usual thing. And uh, then we apply all these controlled uh, unitaries and powers of, of this u. And so we can think about this as, as a controlled application of, of u to the power t. When we see the integer value t in this second register, then we apply uh, the teeth power of u on the eigenstate. So this, this would be this part of the circuit and, and the very end, uh, yeah, and, and this, this gives this state. And now here comes the trick that we just rewrite this state, knowing that u to the t times psi, that is just an eigenstate, so it will just pull out a phase factor, e to the two pi i phi times t. And this phase factor, it would be normally on front of this psi vector, but but this is just a complex number. We can pull it through and put this complex number in front of the other register. This is called the phase kickback trick, uh, so that 
which relies on the fact that if you have a tensor product, then you can freely uh, transform complex numbers from one component to the other one. It's uh, very uh, surprising at the first sight because we were acting on psi, and yet the action seems to be uh, appearing on t. That, that classically, it would seem that we were somehow doing something controlled on these registers and only acting on this against the psi. But actually, this control structure this with this case phase kickback uh, effectively applies a phase to these registers t. And now, the state that we get here after rewriting this with, with this phase kickback you can see that this is just the uh, quantum Fourier transform of this integer n times phi. So remember, phi was this n bit integer number. If you multiply it by 2 to the n, then you get an integer number. And that's a column exactly of the Fourier transform. So if we apply QFT on QFT inverse uh, state, well, then we just get the, that integer, this phi 1, phi 2, and so on, phi n. So this is how phase estimation works if your phase was actually an n-bit binary number. OK. So people usually just uh, stop here and, and don't compute the details, because it's kind of annoying what happens if you don't have a, an n-bit number as a phase. But let's see. Let's compute. It's not so, not so difficult. And I think there are some important messages that we can take away from this. So once again, we start with this. Well, we get this state. Now the question is, what happens after we take the quantum Fourier transform? It will not be exactly a single basis state, but we, we can compute it. So I just uh, I just compute this uh, quantum Fourier transform of this t, and 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 keep this phase factor here. So that just gives this uh, summation over now k. Uh, according to the Fourier transform, and I, and I get 1 over square root n becomes 1 over n. This is just applying QFT. Um, and so now I interpret this, these phase factors that the quantum Fourier transform gives me, this e to the 2 pi i kt over n. I just divide k by n and think about k as no longer an integer number, but uh, a, a number between 0 and 1 with n bits. So this is just rewriting this k in terms of uh, 0 point k1, k2, and so on as a binary number. OK, so now this is what, what I got here. And now this would be basically the estimate. This k is the estimate of, of phi that I get, and I interpret it correctly as a zero a number in 0, 1. So now what I see here, this is a geometric series. Uh, and so I can just apply the usual summation formula for it. And that just means that I, I take one higher power of this quotient minus 1 and divide by the quotient minus 1. This is exactly what I get here. OK, so this is exactly, these are the amplitudes of the different estimates that I obtain. And this is the exact form. But OK, uh, we want to understand what it means to us. So let's compute the probability that we obtain a, a certain estimate, uh, a binary estimate, the 0 point k1, k2, kn, which is delta far from the phase that we wanted to estimate. So here I just continue. I just take the absolute value square of this amplitude, because that's the measurement probability. And uh, I substitute this, instead of writing up this 5 minus this binary number, I just substitute delta. Uh, okay, and, and one other thing I do, uh, since I only care about the absolute value square of this number, I can multiply it by a complex phase. That doesn't change the absolute value. So I'm multiplying this by this particular complex phase. And thi this basically balances out this complex phase here, this uh, e to the this exponential minus 1. I just make sure that it has the same plus minus phase here, both in the numerator and denominator. That was just multiplication by a complex number of unit lengths, so it doesn't change the absolute value. OK, but once I have this form, well, I can use that uh, e to the i x e minus e to the minus i x. That is just 2 times the sine of x. This is just, uh, well, I guess maybe I'm missing a complex number i here. But anyway, it's, it's only absolute values, so I should, yeah, I should fix this typo. But concerning the absolute values, this is, uh, this is true. 
So I can just rewrite this as, as, as a sine of this pi and delta over sine pi delta absolute value squared. Okay, and now I did a little bit of cheating here uh, because, well, it could happen that delta is zero. If delta is zero, then sine pi delta is also zero, so it's a division by zero. I need to somehow cancel this out. So what I'm doing here is I'm replacing the sine function by the sinc function, and, and the sinc function is just sine x divided by x. And uh, the nice thing is that this 1 over n factor is just being absorbed if I'm doing this. You can see that make this sin sine function a sinc function, I should divide it by pi and delta. To, do, to make this sine uh, a sinc funct sin function, I need to divide by pi delta, so the difference is a factor n, exactly this factor disappears when I'm rewriting it. And the nice thing is that uh, this formula, now it's very regular and it works for every value, it doesn't need to assume that delta is non-zero, it's just a very smooth function. And this is what I get. So it's kind of ugly, I plotted this function, this sinc squared pi and delta over sinc squared pi delta for n equals h, so that would be three bit estimation of, of phases. And uh, so this, is, this green is just the function itself. But remember that uh, we had some discrete phase and I assume here that the phase was one over 24, just a choice that kind of illustrates uh, interesting phenomenon here. And uh, while my delta was uh, n bit binary number minus my phase, which is one over 24, so it has eight possible discrete values. Those are denoted by the red dots. So in fact, I get one of the values corresponding to these red dots on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, and the probability of obtaining any one of those estimates is the height of this thing in the graph. So although the sinc function looks kind of nice, it's really ugly. Like this distribution is just not symmetric and I don't know. It, it also has some non-trivial uh, probability kind of far away from the estimate that we wanted to do. It, it has kind of high probability close to the true estimate, but also has some heavy tail. Okay, so what can we say about this? Well, at least we can say that uh, the best, uh, the, the highest probability estimates are kind of close. So the probability of obtaining the best n bit estimate is when this uh, delta uh, is minimal. And when I need to interpret this delta, this difference between the phase that I got and the true phase modulo one because it wraps around. Okay, so, well, you can just see in this plot that basically as delta gets further away from zero, the probability decreases. So the worst case is when this delta min is the largest. Okay, but that delta min uh, can only be as large as one over two to the n because my mesh has size one over n, uh, like spacing one over n. So the worst case is when my true phase is exactly in between two mesh points. So that would be the worst case. And I just compute this, uh, this probability, uh, so this, this is the, the general case. Now the worst case is when I take delta min to be one over two to n, uh, that is a, a lower probability, and I am just dropping this uh, denominator because the sinc function is always less than one in absolute value. So this is again a lower bound, and well, I just, what? Fortunately, uh, the sine function for pi half is one, so only the, the denominator pi half matters, as here. And, well, just compute it's phi o four, four over pi squared, which is at least 40%. So the probability that I obtain the best ambit estimation is not so bad, it's at least 40%, quite good, actually. Um, now, what's the probability that I obtain one of the best two ambit estimates? Uh, and once again, you can see that the two closest one is when you have delta mean and, and also on the other side of the estimate is one, one over n minus delta mean. So this is the two, two closest points uh, uh, co corresponding to your true phase. And you can once again see that actually the worst case happens when you exactly fall in between two mesh points, your true phase. 
And uh, so the general case can be lower bounded by this when delta mu is 1 over 2n. And that is exactly twice the thing that we had before. And so we get that it's at least 8 over pi square. That is at least 80%. So with at least 80% so 80 probability, we get one of the best two estimates uh, in binary. That is pretty good. However, the annoying part was that we got some pretty bad estimates with non-negligible probability. So how to treat that? And for these people, uh, and for these people use this boosting technique of phase estimation. So what's boosting? Uh, it's, the it's based on the median trick, although we can't really, okay, I, I will say a bit more about for the next, next part. Uh, so the generic idea is the following, that suppose that we have an estimator that outputs an epsilon precise estimate with probability at least 80%. Could be other, other thing greater than 50%, but in our case, it was that number, so I just stick to this. So the idea is that you would uh, not decide on your estimate by a single experiment, but you would repeat your experiments a few times, say take S samples, um, and you would compute the median of your estimates. So the, the reason why we take the median is that we might have very far uh, outliers, uh, and, and those could affect the mean. So taking the mean is not a good idea because maybe you have some very, very bad estimates with tiny probability. So we don't want to take the mean, but the median is the right choice here because uh, remember, the expected number of estimates in epsilon precision is at least 80%. We are very likely that we get very good estimates. So in particular, one can see that it's exponentially unlikely uh, that in these S, S samples, uh, at least 50% of the estimates are farther than epsilon. So the expected value of these, uh, of these bad estimates are at most 20%. And now, what's I, ask, I ask the probability that what is uh, the probability that this bad event happening that I have many, many uh, uh, bad uh, estimates, it, it, it's much farther away from its expectation value. So when you have such thing that you have independent uh, samples of something and, 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 and you expect, you want to estimate the probability of an event where the average is lying far away from its expectation value. In this case, you can use the chain of bound, and that tells you that indeed uh, this event has exponentially small probability in S. So taking uh, only a few more samples ensures that, that you are very unlikely to, to, <coughs> to be in the unlucky situation where, you, where your median is, is far from the true value because when more than 50% of the estimates are epsilon precise, then, their median, then the median of all the samples must be within this 50% uh, part, and therefore it will be at least epsilon precise. So uh, maybe, do we have a, yes. Maybe I do a quick drawing about this. So this is the true value that you want to estimate. And this is this epsilon neighborhood. And if here you get more than, OK, I think I should draw bigger. Sorry for that. So this is the epsilon neighborhood. And here I get greater than 50%. Well, then the median, which is the middle value, must also lie within this interval, and therefore it will be epsilon precise. Okay. Uh, now, what's the problem? We are working on a cycle. Yes. Pardon? Is it good now? Cool. Thanks. Yeah. 
So what's the problem here? That the median is something which requires an ordering, right? So here I assume that it's on a line, and I can order my estimates. But we are in a cycle, in, in fact. Phases wrap around. So that doesn't work. However, uh, you can basically uh, apply this idea because we have very nice high probabilities of getting these best two estimates. So what we can modify this uh, idea, uh, adapt it to the cycle, and simply outputting the most frequently seen element. And say if, if we have a tie, then we choose one randomly of these most frequently seen elements. And this will work for the same reason, for, for the same chain of bound argument, because, well, it's exponentially unlikely that the most frequently seen estimate is not one of the two best n-bit estimates, because they have joint probability 80%. So if, if we get one of the two n-bit estimates with at least 2% two well, two-third probability, then, then the other element cannot be more than uh, one-third of the cases. And, and therefore, as long as uh, in our S samples, more than two-thirds of the estimates are actually one of the best two ambit estimates, then the most frequent element must be from these two elements. And so the same chain of bound argument applies. Uh, by repeating this uh, phase estimation experiment a few times and taking the most frequently seen element, actually we are exponentially likely to see one of the best ambit estimates of our phase. And indeed, uh, this boosting in this case means that our distribution will be exponentially concentrated on these two elements. Now, the unfortunate situation is that we cannot ensure that we get a unique estimate with high probability. So we can almost get there. We can get two different estimates with high probability, but we cannot make sure that we get one of them. And this is a bit problematic because what we are doing here is that we are taking a lot of phase estimation algorithms basically in parallel because uh, each, each phase estimation step will keep our eigenstate so we can reuse it, but we use, again, fresh ancillas and just get new and new estimates. The problem is that these uh, prior estimates over which we will uh, compute the median, they are still lying around or taking the most, li most frequent element. And therefore, uh, it is a sort of a garbage state. We don't only get an estimate, but we also get a history of the other estimates that based on which we computed the ultimate value. So it produces a lot of garbage. And that can be really undesirable for uh, getting coherence in quantum algorithms. So um, we will look into how to solve this in several ways. Okay, so one other, as so I will talk about this a little bit later, but now I wanted to uh, talk about this symmetric estimation. So the, si the motivation there is that, uh, remember, this was the actual output distribution, these red dots of the estimates that we got. And it's not symmetric, and in particular, it's uh, we wanted to get something which is unbiased estimator of the true value, and this doesn't look anything like unbiased, and it's probably not, but the underlying function, this thing function is nice. And actually, we can, we can make it that way. Uh, we can recover this very nice, smooth sync function as the true distribution of the outputs. And the trick for that is to apply random shift. So as opposed to doing the phase estimation as before, uh, we do something, a randomly shifted version of it. So once again, we, we take this input, which is this uh, unit superposition with these phases corresponding to this unknown uh, value that we want to estimate. But as opposed to directly doing Fourier transform on this state, we first pick a uniformly random uh, phase. And this will be a phase between 0 and 2 pi over n. Or, well, sorry, now I am including pi in the phase be before I didn't, so depending on how you wish. It's it's a number between zero and one over n, or or multiplied by two pi, uh, and so what you do is that you apply this this uh, this phase gate 
and basically add this additional phase to every uh, state that you already have in this superposition. And after you did that adjustment of this random phase, then you do the Fourier transform as before. And now you will get some outcome J. But you don't, outcome, you don't output the outcome J that you got, but you subtract the phase that you the, the random phase that you added because well, it, cha it changed the, the true phase that was there. And so your estimate will be uh, the estimate that you obtained after phase estimation plus an adjustment by this uh, random shift that you made. Uh, and you can analyze this, and, and as a matter of fact, it turns out, uh, well, of course there is some technical detail here that you cannot really take uh, a zero, one uniform number and, and, and because it has infinite many bits, but if you were able to make it infinite precision, then it would be exactly unbiased. And while well, you can also show that it's if it has many digits, it will be very close to be symmetric. But I don't, don't go into these technical details. I just think about this as a completely uniform random phase that we added in this interval. Uh, and so what we showed with my colleagues, that actually if you do this uh, random shift trick, then uh, the output distribution will be uh, a density function, which is exactly this sync function that we have seen before. Uh, so this is uh, the function. And now all these red dots that were there, they are gone. Now, because we had did this uh, uniform random variable, which kind of shifted things, it means that now we can get any real number as an estimate between minus uh, be between minus pi and pi if we, if we take that phase notation. Um, and it has a continuous uh, distribution uh, of these estimates. And this is exactly this sync function which is nice and symmetric. So now in, in this sense, it's a symmetric distribution around the true value, so we can say that it's unbiased. And that's very desirable in many statistical applications because unbiased estimators uh, have much nicer statistical properties and, and, and you can much nicer combine your different estimates. And so this random shift was a way to tackle this issue that our random mesh of, of, of potential phases can be arbitrarily placed compared to the true phase, which may be an uh, irrational number lying somewhere on the circle. But this random shift, you remove this uncertainty of the placement because you basically place your random mesh randomly, and therefore it doesn't matter what was the actual initial phase for any value, it gives the same distribution of outputs, which is this nice symmetric distribution, which is still heavily concentrated uh, around zero, so giving you good quality estimates with high probability. Okay, so this is now this uh, 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 new version of phase estimation, and well, this is really just from last year. Uh, and so, well, we had some motivation for, for doing this. Actually, this was a key ingredient in a, in a tomography algorithm where we did not only assume that, uh, you know, quantum tomography is the, is the process when you are given an unknown quantum state and you want to learn it to some given precision that you determine. And it's usually studied in, in a scenario when uh, your states are given as copies, so you, gi you get several copies of the state and, and you just do measurements on it. But in many cases, uh, you have a recipe for preparing that state, while well, as a matter of fact in your lab, when you get these samples, you somehow prepare them. Now if you can prepare your samples within a quantum computer, then you have a recipe for preparing your state, which is a stronger access model than just getting copies. And under this stronger access model, actually you can achieve a better precision dependence so this so sort of short noise like 1 over epsilon square scaling, which comes from having only samples. You can get this physicist call it Heisenberg-like scaling, so it's like 1 over epsilon with the precision. precision. And for that, we, as, as a key ingredient for achieving this, uh, this task, we had to uh, ensure that this phase estimation was unbiased and, and we don't get uh, biases ruining our uh, subsequent estimators. But it, it can also be used uh, 
uh, as part of some algorithm for uh, improved estimation of, of partition functions. Uh, Yasin and Aryan wrote a paper about this. Uh, Yasin is also here. You can ask him about more about this. Um, you can also use it for uh, some trade-offs for amplitude estimation, where if you have the full depth circuit, then you can get this Heisenberg-like one epsilon scaling. But uh, as you decrease the depth, you need to do more work, but for less depth. There are some nice trade-offs, and original paper which dealt with this was kind of uh, technical, but now you can just use our unbiased phase estimation, and then your parallel estimates will just nicely work together, and you get the same trade-offs, but with a simple algorithm, basically. So these uh, improvements in phase estimation actually uh, can give you improved algorithms, mostly related to statistical problems and estimation problems and so on. So it really matters to understand phase estimation well. Okay. Uh, and while this is a nice puzzle that you can think of using during the uh, exercise session, if you wish, so suppose that we are using this nice uh, randomized phase estimation algorithm where you get this exact symmetric distribution. Now this is still uh, uh, having this issue that it can have relatively far away estimates with large probability, so it has a heavy tail. Now, can you make such a boosting argument which will keep the distribution symmetric? So somehow you would need to devise uh, a rule which is, again, symmetric, but still achieves the boosting that you wish. This is a nice puzzle. It can be solved, but needs a bit of uh, additional ingredients because the previous boosting that assumed the fixed grid and we just took the most frequently seen element. But now we have a continuous distribution, so with probability one, all the estimates will only be seen once. So we need to do something different. It's a nice puzzle. Okay. So now, uh, in the second half of this lecture, I wanted to uh, connect the, the discrete and the continuous Fourier transforms because uh, uh, I was struggling with this uh, when I learned discrete Fourier transform. I already had some background from physics in continuous Fourier transforms, and I just didn't see the connection. There is some discrete happening. Yeah, it's both called Fourier transform, but one is just vectors, other is functions, and then nice everything is nice and continuous. And this discrete is just messy and basically destroyed my intuition that I didn't know what happens there. And uh, so we, we just uh, recently found a nice way to connect these two to each other. I don't know if uh, this connection seems like must have been known, but I didn't find it anywhere. So if you have any reference, then please let me know. Okay, so first, uh, let me for concretely introduce the continuous Fourier transform. So we have a function uh, on, on the real line, and it can be a complex function, and we define its Fourier transform, uh, f hat omega, as the value of this integral, and I integrate from I minus infinity to infinity, this phase is multiplied by the function. And for normalization, I use this one over square root two pi, and this is a nice normalization because if I use this then, a Fourier transform is actually a unitary transformation on the Hilbert space of square integrable functions. So this is now nicely res resembling this case Fourier transform, which is also unitary, but on the space, on this vector space. Now this is a infinite dimensional vector space, the space of functions, still unitary transformation. <coughs> and to connect the continuous case to the discrete, what we are going to use is some wrapping around periodically. <coughs> so if you have some uh, complex function and you pick some period R, then we define this periodic wrapping uh, as now a function from zero R to C, and for a particular value X, we define it as a, as a summation over X plus integer multiples of R and from some bounds. And well, I could have defined it as, as a summation from minus infinity to infinity, but if I define it this way, 
that is a more generically applicable definition. So in some cases, uh, this summation from minus infinity to infinity would not exist, but this limit can still exist. This is this kind of principal value evaluation of these infinite sums. So this is a. So yeah, he, here we only require that this uh, this summation uh, is is a. Uh, is existing in, in its principal value sense. If you are familiar with analysis, then you have seen these kind of tricks. It's not super important. The important thing is that we are taking uh, a function value and we are adding uh, basically all periodic uh, uh, points with this uh, from this given starting point. So it's really a periodic summation for uh, all the periodic points. And uh, well, because we want to have something discrete, actually, uh, I also define a discretized version uh, of this wrapping, and that will produce uh, an n-dimensional vector from this uh, real from this complex function, and it's the same as before, but now the the j coordinate of this uh, vector will be corresponding to the function value j divided by n times r. So R would be a, a full period, and within this full period, you are at the j mesh point, and you are, again, doing this periodic summation with integer multiples of the period over all the real line. Okay, so now I define this periodic wrapping, and here comes the amazing uh, theorem. Okay, uh, this is just repeating uh, what I said before. So take two periods, T and W, this will be the basis of your periodic summation, and we need to require this Fourier uh, analytic uh, condition that T times W equals 2 pi n. So if this holds, if this relation holds between the two uh, period lengths, then actually what happens is that if you are taking the discrete Fourier transform, of the t periodically wrapped function with n mesh points, then that is the same thing as if you take the continuous Fourier transform of the function f and you are discrete, discretely wrapping it with period w. Okay, so maybe, maybe I should uh, I should draw an image uh, representing this. So we have continuous functions and their Fourier transform. And then we have their wrapped version. This is a T n, and this is F hat W n. So here we have the continuous Fourier transform and here we have the discrete Fourier transform over n elements. And so this is a commutative diagram in the sense that you can either first Fourier transform in the continuous picture and then do the wrapping, or you can first do the and then first do the, uh, the discrete Fourier transform. So if you are first wrapping and then discrete Fourier transforming, you get the same thing as if you are first Fourier transforming in a continuous picture and then do the wrapping. So this is a quantitative diagram in the, same in the sense that well, you're always going down because you can only do wrapping in one direction, but if you first do this or that, you get the same result. And I think this is a nice connection between discrete and continuous Fourier transform. But, uh, well, as usually, terms and conditions apply. I can't speak so fast as uh, usually you hear in ads, but really should check the details now in our, uh, our paper. Mm, but the go good news is that it certainly holds for smooth and rap rapidly decaying functions, and also for quite general functions otherwise. So you can apply this, this uh, strict in quite general setting, but still need to check that everything holds. Basically, the main requirement is that these summations exist and then some additional 
uh, stuff. Okay, so now we have a connection between discrete and continuous Fourier transform. This gives us intuition to understand or, or like gain intuition from the continuous case on what sorts of things should we do in the discrete Fourier transform picture. At least this is how it works for me. And okay, so a nice application is how you do high accuracy phase estimation in a single run. Before, if we wanted to do high accuracy phase estimation, we had to do several repetitions, take medians and do messy things, which also introduce garbage states. So we don't want to do that. But here, the idea is that you should use Gaussian amplitudes. So one thing is that Gaussian is, is nicely rapidly decaying. So if you wrap around the Gaussian with some period length, it's almost the same as truncation. If, you are, if, if, uh, if your width of your Gaussian is, 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 is uh, reasonably less than the period of wrapping, then wrapping around basically has no effect on the Gaussian. The tail is exponentially decaying, so truncating the Gaussian and wrapping is almost the same thing. On the other hand, we know that in the continuous uh, yeah, picture, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Uh, and so uh, it, it also roughly holds for, it, it also holds then for the wrapped around version. So therefore, the Fourier transform of a wrapped around Gaussian will be the Fourier tra uh, tra transform of, of, of the uh, or the wrapped around version of the Gaussian that we would get in the continuous picture. Um, and while there are some approximations if you use truncated Gaussians versus, versus wrapped around ones, but those are really tiny, exponentially small. And the nice thing about this is that, uh, that now what will happen in this uh, discrete Fourier transform, again, I, I should draw something. So you have this uh, circle representing the phases, and then you start with the Gaussian, which is kind of wide. I don't know how to draw it, but you have some wide Gaussian, which then exponentially decays. Uh, and so you are discreetly wrapping it, so in fact it is just going to be some points here. Now when you do the discrete Fourier transform, then it will be almost the same as the as this uh, as the discretization of the Fourier transform Gaussian, so you will get something which will be now much tighter Gaussian, something like this. So if you work through the math, it turns out that if you have this kind of spread out Gaussian, you apply your phases. That is, you know that in Fourier picture, uh, phase multiplication is just shifting in the after Fourier transform, so. You start with Gaussian amplitudes, apply phases, and that will uh, result in a Gaussian after Fourier transform, which will be shifted uh, and concentrated around the value phi that you want to estimate. And now this new Gaussian after Fourier transform will be kind of uh, narrow. That's why you start with a wide Gaussian, that you end up with a narrow one, and it will have now exponentially decaying error probability of getting far estimates. And so if you choose the parameters appropriately, then basically what you get is that you get an estimator uh, with standard deviation, about 1 over n, up to some logarithmic factors that come into the picture, in a single run uh, whose, uh, whose uh, uh, noise devi deviation from the true value is also roughly a discretized Gaussian. And all this you get in a single run of phase estimation without creating any garbage on Scylla states because it's a single run. Okay, so this is what you gain from understanding uh, uh, this continuous discrete uh, connection. And, and one extra ingredient is that, okay, but I said that you should start with a discretized Gaussian. Is it efficient? Previously, we just used Hadamard to get the uniform superposition, but Thankfully, Gaussian states are very nice. You can just create these amplitudes with a very efficient circuit. It's slightly more complicated than just applying Kadamar gates, but still uh, has a low depth. 
Uh, and <coughs> I should mention here that uh, this can be, in some cases, further optimized by choosing the initial weights from some particular distribution that which was uh, understood by people in signal processing, because in signal processing, people want to get the best possible uh, outcome with as, as little resources that they have. Uh, and so they uh, optimized similar things. There also Fourier transform plays an important role. And it turns out that from some uh, perspectives, from Gaussians, you can get a slight uh, constant improvement if you are using some so-called Kaiser window function, which is e exactly optimized for this kind of task, but that only gives you a constant improvement. All right. So now let's apply this trick to Hamiltonian uh, simulation and, and energy estimation. So in quantum computing, we often, yes? Uh, okay, so for this I should go back to the beginning. Look at this circuit. What happens here is that first you prepare a uniform superposition over these values t. Now, you will not do this here, but it will be a preparation circuit that prepares a Gaussian on these t integers. And, and that will be, it, it, it now it is kind of like a flat function over all the values, and it will be kind of a spread out Gaussian in this case. So you need to modify this very beginning. Yes, yes, that, that's absolutely correct. And yeah, for this reason, I wanted to get to Hamiltonian simulation, because this is an, a natural example where you, where you have some control over, over what are the potential phases. So yeah, if, if you just have uh, arbitrary unitary, then thi this can, ha again, have some wrapping issues. But if, if, if someone told you that you know, your, your phase is definitely between a quarter and a minus quarter, then, then you can place your Gaussian in the right place. This is a very good comment. And uh, Hamiltonian simulation is exactly such a situation, uh, sorry, energy estimation which is now what I'm describing. So, yeah, in, in, well, quantum computing can be used for understanding physical systems. Naturally, this is what Feynman uh, proposed it for. So in particular, we often want to understand energy levels of systems, like in chemistry, molecules, and so on. Um, and therefore, it's very useful if we can determine the energy of a particular state that we are given. And well, <coughs> for this, uh, we need a Hamiltonian system, a Hamiltonian matrix, which is describing the energy of the system. And basically, the one, one of the most generic forms, you can assume access to such a matrix, which is uh, in, in quantum uh, computing, is, is a block encoding. So that you assume that you have a, a unitary matrix implemented with some nice quantum circuit where the top left corner of your, of your unitary matrix is just the Hamiltonian that you care about. So this, this just means that uh, take the block, which corresponds to however many uh, ancilla qubits being zero before and after applying V. Really, if, if you would just write down this V as a matrix, then it just means that take the top left corner of some specific size. And the zero bar just means that it's some number of ancilla qubits I don't specify here. I don't want to confuse you. So if you are given such a block encoding of the Hamiltonian H, then you can uh, use quantum signal processing to implement this exponentiation of it, e to the ith, by something like order t plus log 1 of epsilon uses of v. And this will be epsilon precise application of this. And so now what you will do, your unitary in phase estimation will be something like e to the ih over 2 or something. And that will ensure that your phases will be indeed between minus a quarter and plus a quarter. So that these Gaussian tricks help you. Um, and so I don't want to go more details into quantum linear algebra because even we'll talk about this next week. Uh, stay tuned for, for the lectures uh, next week. Okay, so 
if you remember, uh, if we wanted to uh, get a roughly n bit estimate of our phase, we had to apply uh, an n bit estimate is roughly 1 over n precise. We had to apply as large as nth power of the unitary. So, in other words, if you wanted to get roughly epsilon precision, then you had to apply roughly 1 over epsilon powers of u. So, in this case, it means that you would need to simulate your Hamiltonian to roughly 1 over epsilon long times. And therefore, uh, using this phase estimation uh, technique, you can get an epsilon precise energy estimate using roughly 1 over epsilon uses of your, of your uh, sorry, of your block encoding V in particular, and every component of this circuit is efficient. So I just, uh, it is kind of like a query complexity estimation here because I don't want to go into too much technical details, but really the leading order of this uh, gate complexity will be just this one or epsilon uses of, of the block encoding for the Hamiltonian that you care about. Okay, so this is now an application towards physics. And okay, now I want to sketch another generic uh, application. And uh, in this form, it's maybe a little bit less known, but I wanted to tell you this nevertheless because I think it's interesting. Uh, so now this is a generalization of, the, of this Hamiltonian energy estimation problem in the following way. Now you are given a unitary V, which block encodes a potentially rectangular matrix A, which doesn't have to be Hermitian or symmetric. It is just some matrix. Once again, how you define it, it will be the top left corner of your matrix V, which is even a quantum circuit. And this can be rectangular, so now I explicitly stated that uh, this top left corner corresponds to starting with uh, B0 and pseudo qubits at the beginning and ending up with A0 and pseudo qubits at the end. <coughs> Once again, if I just write down this V matrix, it just means that the top left corner of the V matrix is the matrix A. Okay, so this is just how you give the input. Uh, and okay, now I, now I need to uh, describe this uh, singular vector estimation problem, which is a generalization of phase estimation. Uh, so <coughs> for this, we should consider the singular vector decomposition of this matrix. Uh, the singular vector decomposition is uh, something which exists for every matrix, even rectangular matrices. And so this is uh, basically decomposing your matrix as a product of, uh, as a sum of rank one matrices. Uh, so this uj, vj uh, uh, product, this is just a rank one matrix. And this sigma j is the corresponding singular value. And uh, the key property in singular value decomposition is that all the vj vectors are orthogonal to each other. They are orthonormal vectors just like the uj vectors. So these sigma j numbers, these are non-negative numbers called singular values, and these left and right uh, singular vectors, they form an orthonormal system. They need not span the entire basis because maybe you have uh, lots of, uh, may maybe your matrix is singular or rectangular or something, but they definitely are orthonormal to each other. <coughs> meaning that the left vectors are orthonormal within themselves and the right singular vectors are orthonormal with respect to the right orthonormal to the right singular vectors. Uh, yes. So now I define this singular right decomposition of your matrix A. And so the task would be similar to phase estimation or, or energy estimation for Hamilton matrices. We wish to estimate the singular value of a given, say, right singular vector Vj. The same thing also work, works for left singular vectors, but I'm just stating it for right singular vectors for simplicity. So you are given some right singular vector Vj, and you want to learn its singular value uh, in the matrix A. And uh, so it turns out that basically the story for phase estimation goes through uh, if you apply the right techniques and therefore you get similar performance to phase estimation. But there is some annoying technical detail that uh, <coughs> somehow the sign of these singular values is uh, kind of arbitrary. It's you can choose it in a way. It's, uh, it's just a 
standard thing to choose them positive. And basically all methods lead to uh, not producing an estimate of the singular value sigma j itself, but producing an estimate with 50% estimate of sigma j, with 50% an estimate of, of minus sigma j. Well, of course, these are by definition non-negative numbers as we defined, so you can just take the positive one of the two, but that may not be the same as just outputting this estimate itself from this unbiased perspective, but that's just minor technical detail. Uh, and so it was first uh, described this, this, this uh, problem by Kerenis and Prakash, 2016 in this famous uh, quantum recommendation system paper, and then it was later improved uh, by uh, Shantanar Chakraborty and Stacey Jeffrey and myself, and, and with the latest uh, techniques by Arian Kones and, and Yassid Hamoudi, uh, we get basically the nicest version of it, which, uh, which gives basically the same guarantees as phase estimation. One difficulty was in the early uh, attempts is that often you did not fully retain the original singular vector. In phase estimation, it was very important that your uh, eigenstate is not destroyed, it's kept. And, and this was a, a particular property that was very hard to uh, establish in this case, but by now basically all these things are solved. And uh, so it might look a bit abstract, but you probably heard about amplitude estimation, and that is just a, a, a special case of this. So if you have an amplitude estimation, then what, what you have there is uh, you start with some, well, well, you have some state u applied on zero. It's giving you something like, uh, well, OK. Mm. I'm not using these slides anymore, so maybe I can just write it on a new board. Hopefully, it will be good reflection-wise now. Can you see it now? OK. So you have some unitary that on the 0 state prepares something and marks with a 0, say, the good state. Uh, and OK, some amplitude A and plus some bad state and so Uh, with the corresponding amplitude, and you want to learn this value, this amplitude. Okay, but if you write down this matrix, uh, then you can see that uh, zero tensor identity times u, and then, well, here you just apply this input state. Well, that will be just uh, psi good uh, basically, and uh, times this amplitude. And if you think about this not as a column vector, but as a, as a very large matrix, then it has a single singular value that's A. So this column vector as a, as a column matrix has singular value A, and so estimating this singular value is the same as estimating this amplitude. But this is a generalization leading further, and by this I actually ended, uh, got to the end of my slides. So thank you very much and enjoy your meal. <laughs>